Greetings, everyone. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you a Blue Marble Evaluation. Blue Marble Evaluation takes a global perspective on our global ecosystem. And to help you get into that frame of mind coming from whatever time of day you're in and whatever other things are occupying you at this time in this season, I want to begin by grounding us all in images of our blue marble. Uh, so settle in, take a deep breath, and enjoy these images. The blue marble refers to the shot from Apollo 17 in 1972, uh, the first full image of the Earth from space. It gave us a picture of our home together. And I'm going to give you a few additional images of our blue marble as we settle into thinking about what it means to evaluate from a global perspective. What we're gonna be talking about from a blue marble evaluation perspective, taking a global perspective on systems change and transformation. And to do that, I'll set a bit of context around evaluation itself. This comes from a book that I did last year called Blue Marble Evaluation. It is about the challenges that we face that you're all familiar with as the uh, climate emergency and the social justice uprising, the pandemic all come together uh, to affect what's going on. The World Wildlife Federation opened its 2018 report with this quote from Tanya Steele, the CEO. We are the first generation to know that we are destroying the planet and the last generation that can do anything about it. And it's in that context that everything that we do including facing both climate and the future of humanity as a climate emergency, brings us to look at how the past connects to the present and the future. So I've been, I'm coming to you from Northern Minnesota in the North Woods, um, Minnesota being in the North Central part of the US on the Canadian border. Uh, I've been doing evaluation now for 50 years. My first major book on evaluation came out in 1978 about how to make evaluation useful and have done a new editions of that book about every 10 years, have a new edition coming out next year, which will deal with the Blue Marble perspective. And so along the way, I've done books on developmental evaluation, which involves applying complexity concepts to enhance innovation and use uh, principles focused evaluation, which is about how to navigate complexity uh, without models and projects, but using principles. And then last year, the Blue Marble Evaluation book. Evaluation has been dominated since its beginning by a project mentality, uh, doing linear logic models, generating uh, goals, that have the characteristics of being specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And we say that evaluation grew up in the projects. The original commissions for evaluation came out of the American War on Poverty, Great Society programs, all the international agencies, uh, philanthropic foundations, private sector organizations now all engage in a great deal of evaluation. There are uh, 
evaluation associations in all the continents and in all the countries of the world. We estimate that there's some 75,000 evaluators worldwide, uh, including the International Development Evaluation Association, which deals with evaluation in developing countries, and the International Organization for Cooperation in Evaluation, an umbrella organization of the other uh, national and regional evaluation associations. Um, and what we've gotten very good at over the last 50 years is evaluating projects and programs, whether or not they attain their goals, implementation issues, um, measuring outcomes, doing logic models, and generating findings, lessons, and recommendations. Now, what we're finding the world needs and what they're asking us to do and evaluate are new directions. Evaluating mission fulfillment, strategy, advocacy campaigns, policy change, systems change, complex dynamic interventions, community impacts, regional initiatives, networks and collaborations, leadership, inclusiveness and diversity, innovation, collective impact, scaling, environmental ecosystem sustainability, and global systems transformation. None of these things are projects. And so part of what I'm gonna to talk to you about is the way in which um, we're finding that evaluation itself and whatever traditional experiences you may have had with evaluation from a project and program perspective has to be transformed to deal with systems transformation as a focus of evaluation. I'm gonna discuss the implications of taking a global perspective uh, as a context for engaging in evaluation and connecting the local and the global. As no doubt caught your attention in 2015, the United Nations declared that year, the International Year of Evaluation. And it involved a tremendous effort um, to build the capacity of national evaluation associations around the world. This is when the Millennium Development Goals uh, came to an end from 2000 and 2015, and the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted in 2015, which have goals aimed at 2030. So we are a third of the way through the Millennium, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and I was involved in 2015 in a great deal of, of international travel, international workshops. You could have gone to an evaluation workshop at somewhere in the world um, any day of that year and not missed a day. It was a very, very active year building evaluation capacity worldwide. And as I did that work and engaged with the International Program for Development Evaluation Training and a lot of workshops, it began to be clear to me that, that the, while we were building national evaluation capacity and the SDGs are focused on national indicators, none of the major problems we face can be solved at a national level. Um, and even as we look at ecosystems, they, as you well know, they cut across boundaries and borders. Um, and so, when we looked at the Millennium Development Goal reports from 2000 and 2015, these national reports, some 450 of them, all emphasized the primacy of country ownership, country indicators, and for the most part, they were disconnected from the, an ecosystem perspective and a global perspective. When we compare images of the blue marble with a country map, National boundaries are all the result of war, colonialism, enslavement, exploitation, genocide, oppression, greed, politics, and religious persecution, on and on. And so to move from that perspective, we have to do what Martin Luther King Jr. said, and in his memorial in Washington, D.C., the largest marble quotation there is this quote. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This is a cartoon from the book where a father bird is flying with his son bird and the son bird says, dad, when will I get to fly to a different country? And the father says, countries don't exist for us. They are a made up human thing that can cause them lots of problems. Birds don't have borders. 
Well, we do. And we have mental borders, we have conceptual borders, we have sector borders, and we have country borders. The global problems, however, transcend national and agency boundaries. Climate change, economic turbulence, refugees, they have the highest number of refugees at any time since World War II. They're now being called climate refugees, but they're also political refugees, uh, humanitarian refugees, the virulent infectious diseases like the coronavirus. Epidemiologists are saying the coronavirus is not the big pandemic. That's yet to come. This is a dress rehearsal. Our dying oceans, global cyber terrorism. We are in the midst of what may well turn out to be the biggest hack in human history international drug cartels, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, growing poverty and inequality, multinational corporate collusion. It's just a short list of issues we face. So the definitions of the problems are disputed. The facts are a matter of intense debate. Politics and national interests dominate. National interests, multinational corporate interests, agency agendas, competition for resources. The stakes are huge. They affect the future of humanity. Uh, the union of, of scientists moved the doomsday clock ahead another 10 seconds last year, so that we are 80 seconds before midnight um, on nuclear threat and the climate threat. As Einstein famously said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. And so what's increasingly being talked about on the global stage is the need not just for projects and programs, but for transformation of systems. There are transformation conferences going on, um, including this year with the pandemic, although they were virtual. I attended the, my first of these in 2017 at the University of Dundee in Scotland. And one of the participants there was Million Belay, who is coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Um, and he said in a blog following that session, I globetrot from one meeting to another. Some of us are caught up in this cycle and there seems to be no way out of it. Anyway, this year, he was referring to 2017, I participated in nine international meetings. I was active in all of them, either as part of the organizing group or as a presenter. There is one thread connecting all of them, transformation. And so, what I often find at these conferences, however, is that the keynote speeches are about transformation. And then there are two or three days followed by breakout rooms and presentations, which are all about projects and programs that are dealing with very traditional planning, traditional design, traditional evaluation criteria, linear logic models, and clear, specific, and measurable outcomes, not addressing systems at all. Um, people are starting to use the language of systems, but as you would know better than most, actually taking a systems perspective is quite different than simply using the language. The theme of the American Evaluation Association the annual meeting in 2014 was visionary evaluation for a sustainable and equitable future. And so we've had a subgroup of evaluators who've begun thinking about global evaluation, sustainability, the dimensions of a sustainable world. And that work over the last five years led me to the Blue Marble Evaluation Core Principles. And I'll just give you a taste of these rather than going through the whole set. There are four overarching principles um, with a chapter devoted to each in the book. The first one is to apply whole earth big picture thinking to all aspects of systems change. The second is Anthropocene as context principle, the Anthropocene being the designation of this new geologic era we're in when human beings are having more impact on the earth than our natural processes. Um, know and face the realities of the Anthropocene and act accordingly. Transformative engagement principle is to engage and evaluate consistent with the magnitude, direction, and speed of transformation needed and envisioned. And the integration principle is to integrate the blue marble principles in the design, engagement with, and evaluation of systems change and transformation initiatives. Then there are some specific operating principles. The transboundary principle 
is to act at a global scale. Um, the global principle we'll talk a bit more about is integrating the local and the global. Global is the name that's been given to this integration of the global and the local. And the cross silos principle, engaging across sectors and issues for systems change. And number eight, the last one I mentioned at the moment, time being of the essence principle. Act with a sense of urgency in the present, support adaptive sustainability long-term, grounding both in understanding the past. So of these four overarching principles, global thinking, Anthropocene as context, transformative engagement, and integration, um, I'll say a bit about each of those with some examples. And all of them are taking the global perspective of our cross ecosystems, our connection between local and global from a global thinking perspective to see the big picture. Um, think globally, act locally and globally, evaluate the interactions between the local and the global. Um, being able to zoom out to see the big picture and zoom in and see what's happening locally uh, at the micro, meso and macro levels. To look long-term, medium-term and short-term um, and be able to see the interconnections between those different time horizons. And so we have this local notion of how the local and the global, whatever ecosystem you're working in is connected to other ecosystems and ultimately to our global ecosystem on earth. And we understand those interactions. So let me illustrate to you in practical terms what this means and how it has affected my thinking and the work that I do at a, at a fairly practical level. As I said, I'm coming to you from Minnesota. I presume there may be some Minnesotans on this call. The Minnesota is where the last uh, ice age glaciers ended. And so as the glaciers melted, um, they formed lakes. The state motto is the land of 10,000 lakes, although there are actually over 12,000 lakes in Minnesota. And as you might suspect, in a land with lots of lakes and the Mississippi River uh, running down through the, the state bordered by the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Superior, the northern uh, opening of the lake, the beginning of the St. Lawrence Seaway in Duluth, Minnesota, that uh, fishing is the major pastime of people in Minnesota. By one survey, 87% of residents go fishing at least once a year. Um, and so when I would teach evaluation in uh, Minnesota, as I often do, do workshops for philanthropic foundation clients, for grantees, for people who are uh, being called on to do an evaluation, nonprofit organizations, um, agencies, governmental organizations involved in evaluation. I would begin the workshops in Minnesota, not by talking about evaluation, but by talking about fishing and by saying that everything that is involved in evaluation is illustrated by fishing. So that when you go fishing, the question is what kind of fishing you're doing? What constitutes a good day fishing? The number of fish caught, the type of fish caught. In Minnesota, the walleye is the state fish, greatly prized. Northerns um, are great game fish. Are you fishing with the family, teaching the kids to fish, uh, fishing with friends? There are fishing competitions with large prizes. There's ice fishing going on already in Minnesota. Um, and so the number of fish, the type of fish, the fishing situation, all affect how we think about the outcomes. There's what we call goal displacement in evaluation, which is when you don't meet the primary goal, but you hit a different goal, you said, well, that's what was really more important. So when people don't catch any fish, um, they say, well, it was just great to be outdoors. Uh, and of course, there's the cost benefit questions. People spend $30,000, $40,000 on fishing equipment, including boats and, and radar, sonar equipment to locate fish, fancy uh, fishing rods and tackle for something that costs $15 a pound in a supermarket. So what's the cost benefit calculation of that? 
So if we can use fishing, and I often did, to illustrate different kinds of evaluation questions, learning questions about getting better at fishing, uh, summative questions about the overall success of fishing, developmental approaches about um, how to, to work at creating um, different kinds of fishing opportunities, um, the economic impacts of fishing. But what has happened in the last five years from a blue marble perspective is now not just talking about fishing as an evaluation set of criteria like a project or program, but from evaluating fishing to evaluating sustainability of Minnesota's fishing ecosystem. And that involves a different set of questions than how good a particular day fishing was. And so I'm, well, I'm working with people now in Minnesota um, and in other ecosystems, adapting it to whatever ecosystem I may be in. I want to talk with them about how climate change may be affecting the ecosystem. In Minnesota, we know that the walleye are quite sensitive to temperature changes and an additional two degree Fahrenheit change in the temperature of lakes will begin to affect the sustainability of the walleye population. Um, the, there's just been a couple of studies coming out identifying the huge amount of plastic residue that's in Lake Superior and the Great Lakes, the pollution of the Mississippi River that is ongoing and the effects of these large, more virulent storms that we've been having. Um, the, the, the extent to which our city sewer systems are built to handle those storms, a kind of runoff that's increasingly uh, coming from the big storms, runoff of fertilizer and soil um, and other kinds of, of contaminants. We have mercury in our fish, some of which comes from power plants in other parts of the world on the carried by the, the high atmosphere winds. Um, and so when we start to talk about the fishing ecosystem, who has access to fishing, what quality of fishing um, and, and the economic uh, aspects of fishing, the effects on the, on the larger land, um, tribal fishing, the reservation issues, around fishing, we get into a different kind of set of, of questions. And the connection of the water in Minnesota um, to the larger uh, global system. We've got invasive species uh, that we're dealing with here. Mussels are a threat to Minnesota waterways coming in from the international shipping through the, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and so we're clearly connected to this global world, which the pandemic has illustrated so well. This is a different way of thinking about things for evaluators. Um, and so a part of what the field is needing to do, given the importance of ecosystem thinking and global systems thinking, is to begin to look at the implications of this way of thinking for how we evaluate what's going on to break down the silos between environmental work and uh, human work, uh, between social and economic systems and natural systems, but to see these as integrated and interconnected. And that's a main theme of, of Blue Marble Evaluation is to look at the interconnections of things across the natural, human, economic, social, and cultural environments. So with that in mind, let me talk about evaluation criteria that flow from this change in thinking. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the developed countries, in 1991, uh, through their Development Assistance Committee, established five universal criteria for project evaluation. The projects had to be relevant in addressing the priorities of development, they, the, the projects had to be effective in achieving um, their desired outcomes. They had to be efficient in an input output economic sense. They had to have a desired impact that would 
remain over time. And that's what was meant by sustainability, that whatever uh, things resulted from a project continued after the project was over. DAC has spent the last two years, the Development Assistance Committee of OECD, reviewing those criteria, which are now some 30 years old. And they basically kept them the same. Um, they added one criterion at the top right on coherence. How well does the intervention fit with other things going on in a country? But effectiveness aimed at achieving objectives, impact, relevance, efficiency, and sustainability, which means continuity, um, will the benefits last, have remained the criteria. These are the most widely used evaluation criteria in the world. Um, all the international agencies use these criteria. The philanthropic foundations working internationally use these criteria. Um, and so they've become quite dominant and they capture linear project program level kind of thinking, the input output kind of model of thinking. And so I've just come out with an article that reframe sustainability and in fact, the whole set of criteria from a transformation perspective. We're talking about transforming systems rather than simply carrying out projects. What would be the criteria for judging transformation? So the old criteria, relevance, well, they're still current, but what I consider the outdated criteria, relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, coherence, and sustainability, I've offered an alternative set of criteria, transformation fidelity, complex systems framing, full cost accounting, diversity, equity, and inclusion, adaptive sustainability, and interconnectedness. Transfer, transformation fidelity has to do with whether or not the rhetoric of transformation is real. Because of the way in which transformation has gotten a certain cachet, I find all kinds of folks are using the language of transformation. I'm on a Google alert for the word transformation. Most companies uh, are talking about digital transformation, not tra transformation of larger systems. And there's all kinds of transformation uh, articles about transforming one's kitchen, transforming one's hairstyle, um, which is certainly not an issue for me, or transforming one's wardrobe. So transformation fidelity has to do with whether or not systems change is actually the focus of attention. And that that change is looked at through a complex systems framing, which means that we're dealing with nonlinearities, emergence, uh, interactions, uh, uncertainty, not being in control. Full cost accounting adds the economic impacts from a full uh, perspective impacts on the environment, impacts on human health, not just the efficiency criteria of the input output ratios of a discrete project, but the larger effects of initiatives on the environment, on human beings, on human health, on human welfare. And adaptive sustainability has to do with the restoration, resilience, and regeneration of ecosystems, uh, the core piece of, of your work, and interconnectedness has to do with seeing how the various uh, ways in which change and transformation are occurring and the different actors, networks, agents, uh, programs, commissions working in these areas are seeing the relationships between the things that they're doing, working towards critical mass and tipping points around transformation. Last October, in October of 2019, um, a year ago plus, the International Development Evaluation Association had as its theme, meeting in Prague, evaluation for transformational change. At the end of that conference, adopted a declaration on evaluation of transformational change, which included item six, a focus on sustainability, a call to make sustainability a universal criterion in evaluations of everything, given the climate emergency. In all our evaluations, we commit to evaluating for social, economical, and uh, environmental and economic sustainability and transformation 
including by assessing contextual factors and systemic changes. We commit to assessing and highlighting in all evaluations unintended negative social, economic, and environmental effects. This is a real change in criteria for evaluation and it front loops from a blue marble perspective because evaluation criteria are also design criteria. They're planning criteria, they're implementation criteria. And the, that from a blue marble perspective, design needs assessment, situation analysis, uh, implementation and evaluation need to be going on iteratively and together rather than in some kind of, of se a segmented sequence. And so the field of evaluation has become more engaged with these issues. Our main um, journal, New Directions for Program Evaluation, has had in 2015 a special issue on monitoring evaluation of climate change adaptation. And last year, another special issue in which I have an article on evaluating sustainability. Um, the great management consultant, Peter Drucker said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it is to act with yesterday's logic. And so we're talking about transforming evaluation with different criteria and a different logic um, in order to address these kind of more ecosystems perspectives. Um, and to take that very much more into account as we look to future generations and their engagement with the blue marble, which brings us to the diversity criteria, looking at the ways in which our transformation of the blue marble needs to deal with not just climate change, um, but with these larger issues of uh, the increasing disparities between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have nots. We've got articles looking at planetary health in relation to um, human health, uh, increasing numbers of, of works around these issues and a approach that's just emerging called footprint evaluation. Um, from our Better Evaluation Global website, they launched footprint evaluation just in October, saying given the numerous interconnected environmental crises the world faces, including climate change, deforestation, biodiversity, air, water, and soil quality, there's an urgent need to include consideration of environmental impacts into all evaluations. Current evaluation practice and training of evaluators do not usually include attention to environmental impacts unless these are stated objectives. Nor do evaluation teams usually include both people with expertise in systemic evaluative investigation and reporting, as well as expertise in natural systems. And so footprint evaluation is aimed at looking at evaluating human systems footprint on natural systems, including evaluating the potential and actual environmental impacts of interventions that do not have explicit environmental objectives. At the same time, we're getting an increasing call to attend to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as part of the criteria that we use in evaluation. The evaluation equitable issue initiative calls for all evaluations to address equity. And the principles adopted by the American Evaluation Association a year ago, one of which is the common good and equity calls for evaluators to strive to contribute to the common good and advancement of an equitable and just society. The environmental movement has historically been largely a white middle-class movement. And the social justice movement has largely been generated and driven by people of color, uh, like the social justice uprising this summer from the, the murder of George Floyd, uh, the social justice uprising around the world that have followed that. And what we're finding is that the effort to integrate environmental activism with social justice concerns is leading to an attention on environmental justice, where ecosystem sustainability and dealing with issues of equity and justice are two-pronged, that instead of these being separate, they operate together. We're finding that's now emerging in the financial world, and that's going to make a difference in how this moves forward 
the business roundtable you may have tracked last year. The business roundtable is made up of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And in August of 2019, they adopted a statement redefining the purpose of a corporation to promote an economy that serves all Americans. This is a departure from the dominance of Milton Friedman that, and his perspective, which has dominated the last 50 years, that the purpose of a corporation is to make profits for stakeholders, for shareholders. Since 1978, the Business Roundtable has periodically issued principles of corporate governance. Each version of the document issued has endorsed principles of shareholder primacy. The corporations exist primarily to serve shareholders. The 2019 statement includes that corporations should support the communities in which we work. We respect the people in our communities and protect the environment by embracing sustainable practices across our businesses. And so there are major initiatives on what's being called impact investing, the investment integration project, combining environmental and equity considerations. The, we had a webinar with them for the Blue Marble series this year. R3.0, um, looking at redesign, resilience and regeneration as a major approach to impact investing and financial investing worldwide. And did a webinar with them on how those issues can be taken from a Blue Marble perspective. And a book that's just about to come out by Sir Ronald Cohen on impact investing puts front and center the combination and integration of environmental concerns and equitable concerns. This book is going to be getting a lot of attention. It was featured in the most recent issue of Barron's magazine. Um, Ronald uh, Cohen founded Apex, a financial services corporation, when he was 26 years old and built it into a global private equity firm with offices across the globe that now manages more than 50 billion. He says in the introduction to the book, throughout my career, I played many different roles as an entrepreneur, an investor, a philanthropist, an advisor to governments. And he says in the next paragraph, each of these roles has given me the opportunity to view the world from a different perspective. These experiences have led me to understand why capitalism is no longer answering the needs of our planet and that there's a new way forward. In this book, I propose a new solution that we can each put into action. Things cannot continue as they are. As inequality surges in developed and developing countries alike, social tensions arise and those who have been left behind feel they will be permanently stuck there. Our system does not seem fair to them and so they rebel against it. At the same time, environmental challenges threaten the quality of life on the planet and possibly its very existence. Our current economic system cannot correct this threat. Governments do not have the means to cope with our human-made social and environmental problems, nor are they well-placed to develop innovative approaches to tackling them, a process that inevitably involves risky investment, experimentation, and occasional failure. He's created an impact-weighted accounting system to look at how corporations are contributing to both environmental sustainability and greater equity. In this special issue of Barron's envisioning a post-COVID world, what was impressive to me was that this last week, 12 investors, scholars, and CEOs in their comments about the future all focused on the connection between equity and sustainability, all emphasized the importance of China going forward, and all acknowledged the need for transformation. Um, and so what this involves us in then is having to think differently about what's going on. Hannah Arendt, the great philosopher who studied how the Holocaust happened in her book on the human condition and the origins of totalitarianism concluded that the way in which things like the Holocaust occurred is because people don't think about what's going on. They simply go about their business. And the capacity to think, one of her graduate students, who's a good colleague and friend of mine, Elizabeth Minich, two years ago came out with a book that reversed the phrase, the banality of evil to the evil of banality on the life and death importance of thinking. The importance of being able to actually understand what's going on and looking at the way in which people with good intentions 
often do harm, including philanthropists, people in projects and programs, um, because they're not looking at the full picture. Carl Sagan famously said, science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. Percy Bridgman, who won the 1946 Nobel Prize in his acceptance speech said, there's no scientific method as such, but the vital feature of the scientist's procedures has been merely to do his utmost with his mind, no holds barred. So one of the major threads that's emerged in evaluation is about evaluative thinking, not just doing evaluation, but thinking evaluatively, thinking about our criteria, thinking globally. I co-edited a book last year called Thought Work, Thinking, Action, and the Fate of the World. And so I wanna leave you with a reminder of the importance of thinking um, as we take questions. Imagine Aretha Franklin as Mother Earth and her song, Think, being about the Earth. Michael, thank you so thank much, you much for that stimulating presentation. Your presentation really got me thinking. It was incredibly timely, especially given the need to develop, you know, post-2020 biodiversity targets and as we struggle through how to monitor them. Um, so thanks for all the great information. I did post a link to Google Scholar where participants can see some of your contributions and some of the documents that you mentioned. A couple questions to get us started. And for participants, as a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box rather than in the chat. I won't see them in the chat. The first question I think could take us at least an hour to answer. Uh, here, I'll read it to you. It's from an anonymous attendee. How do we meld bottom up and top down transformation efforts to move forward to greater social justice and equitable economy in the post COVID-19 world? Well, part of the reason I ended with the emphasis on thinking is that this work begins by asking those kinds of questions. Uh, that's the right question to ask. That's what needs to, to happen. Clearly, there's not going to be any single answer. But in the Blue Marble Evaluation book, the last part of the book is a theory of transformation. And that theory of transformation says that when we really get transformation, it doesn't happen, as you've gathered from my, my remarks, from a, any single project or program. When we look at transformation, we're talking about the, the end of slavery, the end of colonialism, the end of apartheid, the pushback of the AIDS epidemic, the Me Too movement, social media. Um, these kinds of major transformations are the result of multiple actors, uh, each acting in their own neighborhood, connecting together, um, from the top down, from the bottom up, people doing regulations, doing education, doing finances, taking economic incentives. To, uh, so we, we get transformation from everybody doing their piece, but connecting to the other people doing their piece. Um, and that's how we find tipping points in critical mass. So what, whatever arena you're operating in, that's the right question to ask, and you'll answer it within your own ecosystem context. Great, thank you. Timothy Lewis um, asks, the example you gave on changing the evaluation question from how's the fishing to how's the sustainability of the fishing ecosystem will require a change in the monitoring and management approaches. And here's the question. Can you suggest how to foster a change in agency approaches to monitoring, restoration, and resource management by adopting at the institutional level an adaptive management framework? Well, you've answered the question actually. I mean, adopting an adaptive management framework is, is, is what's needed. But I think that it, adaptive management includes having good information about what kind of adaptation is needed. Um, and so as I've worked with 
natural resource departments in different states and in different countries. Um, one, of the, one of the ways to open up and getting citizen engagement on this is to engage in more citizen science and involve people throughout, for example, in Minnesota, I've long advocated and, and the Department of Natural Resources has not taken it up, that there ought to be an open platform where, where school children, high school students, college students, farmers, uh, people in cities can, can enter in the observations they're making about what's happening in their own ecosystem. They can send in questions, they can take measurements. The meteorologists have done this. You know, our state is, is covered with backyard meteorologists who take the temperature and the rainfall in their own backyard. We ought to be creating those kinds of systems that help people locally measure air quality, look at, at soil depths, um, that these, these are hard things to do and to make it a general uh, matter of, of interest that, that the citizenry is monitoring, sending data in, talking about it, not just controlled by, by the experts, but getting everybody thinking about what's happening in their own, own backyard. What new invasive plants are they seeing? I'm uh, in, and I've got nine acres in northern Minnesota, and every year there are different invasive plants that show up. They're coming from the winds. They're coming from other places. I don't have any place to report that out to people. Um, there are people with that information and data that ought to be sharing so that we create an adaptive management mindset for the entire population, not just for an agency. Yeah, great. Thank you. David Polster um, has a question. He is asking, first, effective ecological restoration rebuilds natural ecosystems so it can accommodate all of these issues. Here's his question. Can we use effective ecological restoration for the transformation that is needed? Well, part of my point is to be sure that you're dealing with the human dimensions of the ecological restoration. So that, that we've gotten into this mess because we haven't attended to those interactions between humans and nature. And so if we don't solve some of the human problems, including disparities and, and economic turbulence, um, racism, systemic racism, the dealing with the environment separately will not solve long-term environmental problems. They may appear to be um, sustainable on purely ecosystem levels, but because humans are inevitably going to be interacting with the environment, uh, we have to deal with human restoration, even as we deal with environmental and ecosystem restoration. That's the complexity of our times. That's what environmental justice is about. And so that, that is a way of, of bringing to this work um, I think a, a larger context for people operating in, in ecosystem restoration is to broaden the way in which we think about the human dimensions of that restoration. Okay, Irshad Sophie um, has a question here. How do we implement the equita equitability models from developed nations to underdeveloped and developing nations? and what should be the guidelines and criteria? It's a big question. One of the, one of the things that, that's emerging in, and it's a major threat in Blue Marble Evaluation is valuing indigenous knowledge, is not thinking that we're going to transport something from any place in one part of the world to another part of the world. Um, you know, it seems to me part of the power of ecosystem thinking is to appreciate the uniqueness of particular ecosystems. So there are principles, um, ecosystem restoration, but the actual practices are, have to be adapted to whatever the ecosystem is. And that's true of diversity issues as well. The nature of disparities is different in different parts of, of the world, whether they're caste systems, tribal systems, indigenous oppression, racism, um, but they're always present. And, there are always um, disparities in access to resources and access to the environment. So uh, the principles of taking on these issues is what 
begins to allow us to address them and ask the questions, but the actual practices are going to have to be contextualized. It's what I call in the principles focused work in Blue Marble that we're driven by commitment to principles, not to try to take a model from one place in its detailed practices and set it down another place. That doesn't work. Um, it, it's a difference, for example, between developing the vaccine for the coronavirus and the campaign to get people vaccinated. The coronavirus vaccine is universal. The campaign has to be different in different communities, in different socioeconomic groups and in different countries. And that's context. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you mentioned um, traditional ecological knowledge and a question came in from Andrea Chevery uh, Alcendra. And she's asking you, but also participants answer in the chat if you're aware, do you, uh, do you know if there is available a review paper about the importance of either TEK, traditional ecological knowledge or local ecological knowledge and ecological restoration? And if not, she's suggesting that might be something interesting to write. So if, if anyone knows- The closest I can direct you to is a, um, um, a framework that's coming out of the Makwa um, indigenous people in Canada called Integrative Science, which is also called Two-Eyed Seeing. Two-Eyed Seeing is seen from one eye with traditional Western science and seen with the other eye from indigenous knowledge. There's some great videos on YouTube. If you just do a search for two-eyed seeing, um, you'll come to those videos and Elder Albert Marshall, who is the leader of this movement, is talking about restoration of both their indigenous culture and their indigenous lands and the relationship between those. Um, and doing that from a framework of integrative science, which is two-eyed seeing, seen from one eye with Western knowledge, seen from the other eye with indigenous knowledge. Um, and th there's quite a, a literature developing around that, but the YouTubes are quite good. The, uh, um, and I, I urge you to take a look at those. Fantastic. Okay, so we have just two minutes um, until the hour, but Michael let me know that he can stay a couple minutes extra because we do have some interesting questions still ahead of us. I'm gonna ask him next about nature-based solutions and then the current global policies on um, ecosystem restoration. And then I'm gonna end with um, Antonio's question um, about um, what about his motivations in sharing this. So that's just a primer. If you can stick around uh, for another couple minutes, please stay on. If you know our hour's just about up, if you have to leave, thank you so much for participating. And I'll put in a plug that our calendar for the next year, the full set of webinar series for the next year will be available and posted in early January. We're going to kick off the year with the presentation on certification, professional certification, and standards for ecological restoration. Okay, let's go to this NBS question. Um, and this is from, apologies for mispronouncing your name, Joyo Tirmoy Shankar Deb. Nature-based solutions are the only ways to restore the ecosystems already degraded, threatened, according to modern ecologists. What do you think of adopting this concept, the nature-based solutions concept? Well, like all concepts, they have to be interpreted. Human beings are the ones who interpret them. So it's not like nature wrote a manual on what to do. Um, it's human beings who are devising nature-based solutions, explaining what they mean. They are social constructions as much as they are natural constructions. I think they're quite powerful uh, it's a quite powerful lens for understanding the world, but we have to understand that the very language of nature-based solutions disguises the fact that it's human beings who are designing and interpreting what those systems are, what they mean and how to implement them. Yeah. And so they have all the foibles of human beings doing such things. Yeah, interesting. Okay, here we go. Um, here's about uh, current restoration policies. And this is from Wallace Johnson. 
as government builds policies on restoring ecosystems, how do you suggest bringing restoration evaluation into this? How do you best suggest to bring the need for evaluation to the forefront and include as part of the system and justify this to politicians? And then he has a comment, often we bring sites to a remediated and reclaimed state without further looking to whether ecosystems are being restored over the long term. Well, there's, I mean, part of what has gotten us into this current mess um, where our future is as humanity's in doubt is short-term thinking. Um, and nothing is more difficult in the political world than long-term thinking. Um, elections aren't in the long term, they're in the short term. Uh, and so the, the challenge, um, I actually think that, that while we have to work and educate policymakers as, as much as possible, um, the kind of uh, frames that we're coming, the policymakers are coming up with and the expertise that directs them traditionally out of evaluation remains the linear logic models, smart goals, the SDGs, there are 17 categories of SDGs with uh, uh, some 180 goals and 212 indicators, all of which are siloed. Um, that's not an integrated perspective. The, each of them has a massive machinery behind it, measuring its own isolated indicators with its own territoriality. And so um, politicians ultimately in many parts of the world, certainly not all, take their clues from the things they hear from constituents, from what humans understand, from what their people understand, from what experts understand. And so all of us together um, need to be carrying the message about thinking longer term, that's going to mean some, some major transformations of systems that will be disruptive to those who benefit from the current systems. And to bring about those kind of changes um, involves political transformation. Um, and we'll all find ourselves in that in that bind going forward. So I think, as much as anything, it's bringing a long-term perspective to bear. Interesting. I want to throw in one question of my own. I I really gained a lot from your presentation. I work in monitoring and evaluation, um, and. I, I hadn't really thought about the fact that often in my work, I don't include anyone from the formal evaluation community. I include people who work on natural resource evaluation. And um, I'm getting to my question here, which is one of the things I usually need to do is to work with people on evaluating the efficacy of the evaluation process itself. And I'm wondering if you have any guidance from the evaluation community about best practices for that or any resources to share that would help us in the natural resource community add evaluations of our monitoring processes. Did that make sense? It makes great sense. I mean, it gets to the heart of my whole career has been based on how to make evaluation useful, which is an evaluation of evaluation yes. and how it's, how it's used. Um, the principle I would offer you in the short time that we have is to both for evaluation of the work and for evaluation of evaluation to build it in to the work, integrate it in so that it's not an add-on. What keeps evaluation from being useful is that it gets separated from the work, it gets separated from planning, from budget cycles. The whole idea, for example, of an end of project evaluation is worthless because all decisions about the future have been made by the mm. time you get to an end of the project. So mm -hmm. to do an end of project evaluation guarantees that there's no audience for it. Everything's been decided at that point. It sounds reasonable. Oh, we ought to evaluate at the end, but that's too late. And so thinking about connecting what decisions are getting made. Developmental evaluation is about ongoing decision-making and connecting evaluation to ongoing decision-making in real time, and then getting feedback from the people making decisions about the value of the information provided them under conditions of complexity and uncertainty of helping them uh, take action. 
So that's an ongoing process. It's not a one-off. It's not a survey at the end. Um, it is building evaluation into the thinking and decision-making process on an iterative basis, um, embedding it uh, and connecting it to the decisions as they get made and getting feedback about the value of that as it happens. Great, okay, I wanna end with a question that came in from Antonio Churcherio. I, I love this question. He says, hello, my name is Antonio. I'm currently a college student doing research. I have a general question for you. What motivated you to share this event with others? And I'll add on to that. I'm curious what motivated you to go into this specific field of evaluating evaluation? Um, I'm going to pull up my slides here quickly for a moment to illustrate, and this is controversial for those of you who know evaluation. Um, Nicholas Natali wrote an important book many of you may know called The Black Swan. Last year, he came out with a book called Skin in the Game in which he argued that when people are giving you advice about anything, you want to know what their skin is in the game. That's what this question, final question is. What's my skin in the game? Um, and he argues that, that, for example, if you're getting financial advice from somebody about your retirement portfolio or buying stocks, don't ask them what they think you should do. Ask to see their portfolio and base your analysis on what they've done. So my skin in the game is that I have children. I have grandchildren. Um, my daughter has decided to become an evaluator. She's one of a handful of second generation evaluators. We now know of about 10 uh, of those of us who are pioneers in evaluation whose offspring have decided to be evaluators. I have grandchildren. I care about their future. Um, and I want to see them have a, a future. So my skin in the game is that perspective. What the indigenous knowledge teaches us, what the Native American tradition teaches us, is to look ahead to seven generations, is to look at everything that we do and ask what its implications would be seven generations from now. I want my children and grandchildren, with whatever challenges they face, to know that their papa was engaged in his own backyard, um, his own area of expertise in trying to make the world a better place and to use whatever skills and understandings I had uh, to do that. So my skin in the game is very personal and very real to me every day. Michael, thank you so much for rounding out our 2020 webinar series. This was really fantastic. We saw a lot of uh, engagement in the chat and um, thanks to you for your presentation. Thanks to all the participants for participating today, for introducing yourselves, using the chat for networking and joining the series through the year. Hope you guys all have a great new year holiday season and hopefully we will see you in January. I did provide my email address in the chat if you scroll up. I did it a couple of times. So feel free to email me if you have any questions about IUCN CEM, that's the Commission on Ecosystem Management or the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group or the webinar series. Happy holidays, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.